welcome along and let's get into it. Uh, I thought we'd start with one of my favourite quotes on sunlight. And it really is it's a nice way to start when you talk about sunlight and talk about summer and all this wonderfulness that we've started enjoying just recently. Sunlight is like good champagne. It invigorates and stimulates. Indulged to, in, to excess, it intoxicates and poisons. And it's a nice way of summarising it up because the sun is so important. And yet so many of us have been, we've been taught for so long that it's somehow damaging and dangerous and all the different things that we've been told. So when you actually look at it, when you ask the question, and this was back in the 1920s, this information was around, how could we have evolved and survived as a species if we were that vulnerable to something that humans have been constantly exposed to for their entire existence? And it's a really good question when you think about it. How is it that we've been taught that something's so damaging when without it, most of the ecosystems on the planet crash within a few days? So sunlight's very important. What does it actually do? And this is when it starts to get interesting. What does sunlight actually do? Well, it runs your immune system response. And we'll get into that as we go later on. But it actually completely dominates it via the power of vitamin D. And that's where the connection with sunlight and vitamin D comes from. It runs the immune system of most animals on the planet. Most animals are run by vitamin D. When you go outside and you see a cat or a dog or a sheep or a goat or a cow or a kitten or whatever, they're all having their immune systems run with vitamin D, which is from sunlight, which they get on their skin. Sheep with lanolin on the wool on the outside of the sheep. Uh, and your immune system, of course, dictates 85% here in your gut. That actually dictates so much of your health. It dictates whether you get sick. It dictates how regularly you get sick. It dictates how badly you get sick. And then it dictates how quickly you get well, which is all dominated by your immune system. And your immune system modulators are all run by vitamin D. And 90% of your intake of vitamin D should come from sunlight. So you can start to see if you are regularly sick or unwell, part of it could be a lack of sunlight. So we'll go into that as well as we go. So there was once a pharmaceutical zealot, more offensive than insect repellent. He just couldn't see what's in vitamin D. It's not useful unless we can sell it. And I really like this because it really sums up why is it you don't hear enough about sunlight and the good sides of sunlight and why sunlight's so important, why vitamin D's so important. It's because it's free. Like vitamin D is free. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to go anywhere to get it. You can just literally walk outside. It's your God-given right to get some sunlight on your skin. So, you know, we don't hear a lot about it. And I love that summary of this is why you don't hear because, you know, no one makes any money. So when you look at it, though, every culture of centenarians have existed and grown and lived under direct sunlight. It's been part of all the different cultures from the Hunza, Pakistani Hunzas to the Japanese Okinawans to the Sardinians, the Italians, the Loma Linda uh, Californians, they all live under direct sunlight. It's a crucial part of longevity. And the human race and almost all mammals have all evolved and grown under sunlight as well. And playing in the sunshine every day outside is better for you than a library full of health advice. And it's one of those great things when you think of what grandma used to say. What grandma used to say was, eat your greens and then go outside and play. And they were kind of the mantras that we all heard from our grandparents. And of course, they're so true. Go outside and play. What happens when you go outside and play? You breathe fresh air, you laugh, you have fun, you exercise, you stretch, and you get sunlight. Just through going outside and playing outside, not on a treadmill, not at a gym, but actually outside in the sunlight. And our grandparents really nailed it in that sense. And the other thing was eat your greens. And of course, where does chlorophyll come from in greens? From sunlight and photosynthesis. So again, you're eating the goodness from the sun. So really ties in very well when you look at it. Vitamin D is so crucial to the functioning of your immune system that the ability of vitamin D to boost immune function and destroy invading microorganisms has been retained through 60 million years of evolutionary selection and is still found in species ranging from the squirrel monkeys to baboons and humans, suggesting that it must be critical to their survival. The existence and importance of this part of the immune response makes it clear that humans and other primates need to maintain sufficient levels of vitamin D. It's a really good summary from a meta-analysis uh, from Oregon State University a couple of years ago. And the interesting thing about this meta-analysis is when you take lots and lots of different studies and you compile all the information together and you look at what the themes are. So it could be a huge study of Okinawans and a huge study of Hunza Pakistanis and a huge study of uh, Icarans and Sardinians and Loma Lindas and all the different centenarians. You look at the studies of all of them and you step back and you see what are the common themes that go through them. And one of, of course, the common themes that you hear me talking about a lot is walking. It's one of the common themes through all the centenarians and the healthiest people in the world is they all walk. They walk, 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 walk. They walk everywhere. They live while they're standing up and they're always exercising and walking. Another one is sunlight. And one of the interesting things is when you look at a meta-analysis like this one done by a university, what they found was one of those things that runs through all of us as humans is that we all run on vitamin D. 
It's a huge part of what keeps our immune system functioning so well. It's having enough vitamin D, and of course the primary source of vitamin D for most of us is sunlight on the skin. So sunlight and vitamin D are inextricably linked. They work together very closely, pretty much one and the same. Now, vitamin D is not the only thing you get from sunlight, but it's one of those things that's easy to talk about because we understand it, but it's not the only thing you get. And the hysteria around skin cancer is one of those things that's blinding us to our need for sunlight. We do need sunlight. Do we need to get burnt? No. Do we need to get skin cancer from overexposure of sun? No, it's not advisable, obviously. Just want to make sure that's really clear for people. That I'm not talking about getting sun burnt or getting fried or getting damaged from skin, from the sun on your skin. I'm not talking about that. But we are reaping the downside of years of sun scare advice, which has ironically started about 30 years ago when we started discovering how good vitamin D was. We also started discovering that we should stay out of the sun. Kind of ironic, really, when you think about it. But a lack of sunlight makes you weaker and more susceptible to illness, and particularly your immune system function. And the simple way to say it is your body actually runs on sunlight. Now that sounds kind of stupid, but it actually is quite factual. Because when you actually look at the science of what happens with the sunlight coming down in the soil and the air and the water creating plants and turning into chlorophyll via photosynthesis, we then eat the chlorophyll and it fuels our cells. And it's one of the most critical parts of nutrition, of course, is chlorophyll, which is green, literally green sunlight. So are we fueled on sunlight? Yes, we are. So it's important to get it either in food as well as obvious exposure. So what does sunlight do? It runs our immune system. It keeps us healthy. It balances our emotions, and we'll talk about that as we go. It strengthens our body. It makes us happy and keeps us happy. Uh, it helps us to avoid obesity and diabetes and getting overweight. It's linked to prevention of almost all modern illness uh, and helps feed us complex carbohydrates via chlorophyll photosynthesis to give us the good nutrition as well. So the three-step process of how we get sunlight hasn't changed in a millennia. It's the same old thing. We spend about three months a year outside in sunlight, getting the sunlight in our skin and storing it in the cells of the body. We actually store it in the fat cells. And it happens to animals as well, right, right around the world. And as it's fat soluble, the body can then drip feed it to you like an IV or like a slow release drip throughout winter when we get unwell. So this prevents winter bugs coming in. And this is why if you've got enough vitamin D stored in you through the summer, then that will activate your immune system much more effectively through winter which is why you get even the races that don't get enough sunlight, they'll be eating a lot of oily foods, oily fish and things like that to get that vitamin D. So that when they actually literally go and hibernate, they've got the vitamin D which the body will then call on because it's stored in the body as required. It's not like vitamin C or vitamin D which are water soluble, which go right through and you need to keep eating them regularly. Vitamin C needs to keep coming in, keep coming in all the time to keep it. And that's why fermented foods are so good. It's a good way of getting vitamin C through winter, preserving foods naturally. Vitamin D is different stored in the fat cells of the body and the body can call on it as required. So the same three-step process hasn't changed. It's exactly as it always has been. So why is vitamin D so important? And that's one of the questions I get asked a lot. Well, it keeps you well, runs your immune system, and it keeps you happy. And of course, happiness and being able to be balanced emotionally is so much a part of our immune system function as well. I could do a two-hour presentation on the research and studies on the happier and more balanced you are, the better your immune system work and your gut, you know, the whole thing about when you break up with someone and you're literally gutted, you know, or if you're in love and then you can't sleep, and you don't have to eat and you just fly through life and nothing is a problem, you know, all from an emotional thing. So there's a lot of time with that and we may well do a seminar about that, it'd be a fun seminar to do. But about 30 years ago was when the sunlight and the vitamin D research all started happening. And it was R. Edgar Hope Simpson. And what he discovered, and I'll read it out because it's quite an interesting thing he said, which is actually a really scientific way of saying something really simple. But what he said was, a seasonal stimuli from solar radiation explained the remarkable seasonality of epidemic influenza. Now, what he was simply saying is that something about sunlight and regular exposure in the warmer months protects you from bugs and colds and viruses in the colder months. And he was absolutely right. He was totally on the money. What he was distinguishing was we store something in sunlight in the body that protects us from being unwell during winter and coldness. And what he distinguished was vitamin D. Now, he wasn't the first one to do that, but he put it in such a way that people started taking notice because he started measuring it. So what vitamin D does is it stimulates the epithelial, the natural killer cells, which strengthen the natural epithelial cells lining your respiratory tract. And, of course, this protects you and plays a major role in keeping your lungs protected from disease and illness, which is why when you look at the major population studies, and I've got four of them now here, and these are big studies on tens of thousands of people, different parts of the world at different times through history, all showing the same thing, that the children who have got the highest levels of vitamin D in their body as they go back into school and when they're in the winter have the lowest rates of sickness. 
And you see it time and time again. And it's funny, when I talk to teachers, I get the same feedback that they say the same children get sick the same amount of times each year, whereas the healthy children don't. And a big part of that, of course, is getting enough sunlight. It's not the only thing, but it's a key part of it. Vitamin D deficiency predisposes children to respiratory infections. So the less vitamin D they have, the higher the rates of res uh, respiratory infection. High vitamin D levels reduce the incidence of respiratory incidents in children. So again, making sure they've got enough vitamin D is really important to keep your kids healthy uh, throughout winter. Is all sunlight beneficial? No, of course not. Of course, you can lie up there in the middle of the day, get fried. It's not going to be any good for you. So not all sunlight is beneficial. The key thing, though, is, and I've summarised it up really nicely so you can remember, is UVB gives you vitamin D, UVA takes it away. So the key thing to remember is you need more UVB. Now, I'm going to say a couple of things here which for some of you are going to be very controversial about the time of day that you need to get sun to get vitamin D. Nevertheless, it is actually the truth. UVB is the sunlight, by the way, the bandwidth which catalyzes the conversion of vitamin D in the human body. So the UVB is what you actually want on the, on the skin converting into vitamin D. Now, UVB exposure is highest from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. That's actually when there's more UVB available. Now, you can get UVB outside of those times, but that's when there's more available. Carcinogenic causing UVA is lowest between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Now, that is a very unusual thing, and I can see a lot of you going, what? And it is, but that's just, actually, if you measure sunlight, that's just how it is. It's not up to me, it's just how the sun works. So, when you want the highest doses, it's small doses in that hot time of the day. And again, not getting burnt. So, my simple tip is, and here's one of the funny things, we get very complicated about sunlight. But when you actually look at what nature does, and if you're actually out, I go walking in the morning, I was just talking this morning about our walks in the morning up to Cornwall Park, and I notice that when I'm out there and I'm walking, I see the sheep in the park, and I see, you know, I see the birds in the park, and the cows in the park, and you see dogs, and they're running around having a great time. They're all out in the sun. Now, if I go walking at about midday, I'll notice that the animals have this incredibly intelligent thing they do when they get too hot. It's this amazing, deeply significant instinctual reaction. Do you know what it is that they do? They actually get into the shade. <laughs> and it's something that we, have to, we struggle with as humans. You know, we think, no, it's my right to stay out in the sun all day. That's fine if you want it. What I'd recommend is get sunlight until you start to feel uncomfortable. You start to feel a little bit of a pinkishness on the skin. You start to feel that I've had enough sun. That's when you need to get out of the sun. So then get out of the sun like the animals do. They actually don't stay out there when they're uncomfortable. They turn around and they slowly walk over and sit under a tree and get in the shade. And that's the smartest thing to do. So... It's not about overexposure, it's about smart sun exposure. So what actually is vitamin D? Well, it's not a vitamin at all. So the thing to remember is that don't compare it to vitamin C because it's not. It's actually a pro-hormone that becomes a steroid hormone metabolite epigenetic modifier. And that's how it works in the human body. And I know that's a handful, that's why we call it vitamin D because it actually makes it easier for us to understand. But a hormone basically is something that we make in one part of the body and then we use in another part of the body. So that's what a hormone is. And all cells and tissues in the body can benefit from vitamin D or use vitamin D right through. So it's responsible for the regulation of over 3,000 of our genes. Now the interesting thing here is that that's 13% of your total genome. Now your total genome, of course, the human body is 23,688 genes. That's how many genes we've got. Now if you've got one particular hormone that dominates 3,000 of your genes, that's 13% of your health profile for one thing. And that one thing you get from sunlight on the skin. So you start to see a connection between my entire genetic expression as to whether I get well or whether I get unhealthy or whether I live a long, healthy life or not. So much of that is about our genetic expression. And of course that comes from the food and the lifestyle and how much sleep we get and things like that. But one of those key things is vitamin D. So if something impacts you to 13% of your health profile, that one thing, it shows you how powerful it is. And here's the interesting thing. So much of that cellular activity is in your immune system. So not only does vitamin D influence about 13% of your genome, but it also does so, majority, the majority of it's in your immune system, which of course runs whether you get sick or not. So very important. Just one gene as an example that vitamin D impacts when you get vitamin D creates over 200 antimicrobial peptides. And what they are is they're things that create your own personal antibiotic. So, you know, you go into winter and you get told you're getting sick, so you have a dose of antibiotics, but then you know that's going to kill you good biotics, and you go out so you don't know what to do, and should I get sick, or should I take the drugs, and blah, 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 all of that. Well, vitamin D creates your own personalised antibiotics in your gut that are your own ones to protect your gut from getting unwell. So, very powerful. The benefits are endless. You know, the human immune system is actually programmed to activate itself through vitamin D. So vitamin D is what kicks out and makes it work. And that's the reason why, if you've ever wondered why you get sick in winter, 
but you don't get sick in summer. Notice that you haven't been concerned about coughs and colds the last 12 weeks or the last 10 weeks. However, going into April, May, you will be, because you know that often, you know, for somebody, you get sick a lot during winter. That's the key thing. One of those key things is what do we do different? We get sunlight. You can go into the winter flu season in a state of vitamin D deficiency. Your immune system is essentially defenseless. So making that happen is really important. So why is sunlight and vitamin D and calcium and iron so important? Key question. And why are they so dominant in running and creating our immune system, our bone health, our longevity, and our disease risk? So let's have a look at that. When a T cell, which is your body's uh, first reaction in the immune system, is exposed to a foreign pathogen, it extends a little signaling device known as a vitamin D receptor with which it searches for vitamin D. So the first thing a T cell does is pops its little thing up and says, vitamin D, vitamin D, come vitamin D. And this means that the T cell must have vitamin D or activation of that cell, as in your defense system, will not kick in, will cease. If the T cells cannot find enough vitamin D in your blood, in the body, somewhere, it won't even begin to metabolize. Now, mobilize. Now this is interesting because this comes from university studies in immunology and microbiology. So this comes direct from the heart of how does your immune system work? actually through T cells, which are run through vitamin D receptors. Happy, happy, joy, joy. That's the other thing to remember about vitamin D. You ever wondered why, you know, when you go on holiday and you get off the plane in Fiji, you don't go, oh, this is such a bummer. No, you don't. You know, when the, 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 the sunlight hits you, you go, woohoo, oh yeah, life is great, right? And that's the great thing about vitamin D, and that's what's known as the happiness vitamin. And it's been known as that forever because literally it is one of those ones that not only does it run your emotions, but it keeps you balanced emotionally as well. Vitamin D known as the happiness vitamin because it protects us from depression, protects us from seasonal affective disorder, or that great acronym, SAD, of course, uh, and keeps our emotional state lifted up, which is why you get those laid back cultures of people that live in the tropical islands or the Pacific Islands. They've always got the kind of laid back, happy vibe about them and nothing bothers them, that whole thing. The key part of that is literally having enough vitamin D. They've even done studies. As far back as 1988, American psychiatric research showed that regular exercise outside under sunlight uh, prevented depression more effectively than psychiatric counselling did. And we know that it's far more effective than current medical drug as well, drug therapy. So really important to get enough vitamin D just if you want to keep your emotions balanced. And for so many of us in the stressful lives we live, having balanced emotions is a great thing. You know, it's a great thing to be able to survive the current world that we live in. So how, where do we get vitamin D? Well, the best way to get it, of course, is direct, unfiltered UVB sunlight on the skin. And that's converted then into cholecalciferol, best way to get it. And D3 is water-soluble if you get it that way, which means the body can convert it through the liver and travels around the blood quite easily. Uh, and that's then converted by enzymes and stored in your fat cells in the liver for 20 days or so until required. So if you're leading into winter, you can get a nice good dose of vitamin D in the body. So it can last a little longer, but it's a good way to store it in the body. So how does it work? Well, the body, when it requires it, it yells out for the parathyroid hormone, which is up in the brain, which works with calcium as well. And of course, we know vitamin D and calcium work so well together from the same part. Uh, and the body then moves some stored uh, vitamin D from the uh, liver to the kidneys. Once it's in the kidneys, then the kidneys convert it into a steroid hormone a metabolite called 125D, which is short for this really long word, which I'll read out for you in a minute. The 125D only lasts about eight hours. But during that time, it's the most powerful primary immune-boosting compound and key regulating agent that the body has, bar none. This is pretty much your single key effective defense against getting unwell, is 125D when it's active in the body. It's extraordinarily powerful. So never underestimate the ability that what vitamin D does with your immune system. The optimal immune system response to a microbial attack, of course, will, will not work fully unless it's biochemically activated with enough 125D. So as soon as your body gets a foreign pathogen in there, it starts to modulate, and it says, what are we going to do? And if there's enough vitamin D, the immune system will not kick in fully. And that's when you get allergic reactions and all kinds of problems and colds and coughs and bugs and viruses, and you go down like a sack of potatoes, as my dad used to say. Vitamin D also prevents your body from overreacting and having too much inflammation. So uh, with the human body, inflammation we know is one of those things where short-term inflammation is great because it saves your life. Long-term chronic inflammation is terrible because it'll kill you. So it's that fine balance. And the irony is, that kind of inflammation is run by something which comes from something else, which is short-term regular exposure to is good, long-term exposure to will kill you, like sunlight. It's exactly the same thing. So inflammation works the same way sunlight does. Little short bursts regularly, good for you. Long exposures when you get too much, not good for you. Same thing, balance. 
mod, mod, what, what's the moderation in all things? The same old great thing. So 125D can interact with every cell in the body directly or indirectly, so it has an amazingly powerful effect right through. And this is where we get into the interesting stuff. So this is care of uh, another source, which I give thanks to. This is really interesting because it talks to you about how it actually works through the process. So you start off with the hydrocholesterol, cholesterol, which is vitamin D precursor. You then get UVB here raised from the sun, which creates pre-vitamin D3 in the skin, and it turns into cholecalciferol, which is D3, which turns into hydroxy, vitamin D3. Now you can get cholecalciferol from food and supplements, or you can get uh, ergocalciferol. Generally they come in uh, D2 as opposed to D3, but you can get D3 or D2. This then converts in the body to hydroxy vitamin D3, which then becomes, as I talked about, 125D, which is how we, sh we shorten it to talk about it. It's actually dihoxy, dihox, <laughs> dihydroxy vitamin D3, which is the activated form, which then gives you your activated versions in the body, which is why we talk about 125D. So this is the part here which we want to build on and work with. And to do that, the best way is straight through this way. You can get smaller amounts this way. And I'll talk about the balance of foods versus sunlight as we go as well. So vitamin D is critical for a number of things, but firstly bones. For many of you are probably well aware calcium is important, but also vitamin D is important. Vitamin C as well, because vitamin C stimulates collagen. So it's important for a number of things, but bones and everything to do with it, from calcium absorption to bone mineralization, the prevention of things like osteoporosis, parathyroidal hormone function, serum, calcium levels, all the different things to do with bones. Brains as well, smart brains, brain health, motor control, learning, memory, things like that. It's one of the fat-soluble vitamins, so it's important for the brain. Weight as well, for preventing diabetes, vitamin D. A lot of research about vitamin D and diabetes and prevention. And also uh, keeping your insulin level balanced and your blood sugar level balanced as well. So very important in terms of keeping a healthy weight and preventing diabetes and things. Your immunity, obviously I've talked about that as well. I've gone over that already, probably in quite detail. But in terms of preventing the invading bacteria and things like that. Uh, and also your muscles, very good for preventing muscle weakness. It's one of those reasons also you feel a lot more empowered and physically strong when you're running up and down on the beach. You know, in summer you can do exercise, you're outside, you feel amazing. The less vitamin D you have, the less physically strong you feel. So again, going into winter when we generally tend to curl up in a little ball and eat lots of chocolate and sleep all the time, and uh, then we kind of crawl out of the house at the end of winter. Well, vitamin D, keeping enough, in your, enough levels of vitamin D before you go into winter is really, really smart because it will, you know, protect you through that period. Your heart as well, very important for heart function, and again a lot of research on vitamin D and heart health, congestive heart failure, stroke, preventing, uh, preventing all those kind of conditions, and your emotions. The other key thing, depression, seasonal affective disorder, the winter blues, schizophrenia, a lot of research on the kind of mental, really intense mental disorders as well, particularly as you get older. And there's a number of other things too as well, so I've put a selection up there for you to look at from gout and psoriasis, multiple sclerosis, of course, key links, autoimmune disorders, an enormous amount of work being done on vitamin D and autoimmune disorders as well. So a huge range of different things that vitamin D is very, very good at preventing. Also cancer, another one that has a lot of research on vitamin D on these days. One thing we do know is that most cancer tumours cannot grow or function in the presence of vitamin D. Similar with an alkaline system as well, when your pH levels are balanced, Cancer has a real trouble growing in oxygenated environments. We know that there's been Nobel Prizes given out for the scientists that distinguish that cancer cannot grow in a highly oxygenated environment, which is where you get into pH and acid alkaline and all that. I think actually, for memory, that's the next seminar coming up. Is it acid alkaline, I think, for memory, is it? Could be, but anyway, it, it's coming up if it's not soon, and that's really fascinating because you get the, the other side of cancer as well. So vitamin D influences the action of genes that regulate the proliferation of cancer cells. And what that means is, Vitamin D has an enormous influence on whether the genes express themselves in a way that leads to cancer growth or not. So again, very, very anti-cancer, very powerful at keeping low levels of cancer. It's one of those realised uh, connections between breast cancer and fat cells and vitamin D. It has an enormously powerful effect at lowering your risk of breast cancer. It's why one of the advice used to be when you were pregnant is to get sunlight when you're pregnant so that you build up a lot, high levels of vitamin D for the little one as well. So California scientists and doctors have shown in a number of scientists, uh, studies now that colon cancer, breast cancer and ovarian cancer could be reduced by about 75% if people had enough sunlight. And it's fascinating when you start to get into how they work these studies out because what really start to see is the lack of sunlight that we have now in our lives. Most of us are seriously malilluminated. We just don't get enough sunlight. We don't go out in the sunlight. And when we do, we're terrified about it. We wear sunscreen, as you're saying, and I'll get to. So one of the interesting studies they did was when Japanese women there was a massive migration, natural massive migration from Japan to Hawaii after the Second World War. 
and it's given us a plethora of an incredible research from decades and decades and decades of genetically similar people, sisters, brothers, aunties, uncles, genetically identical twins, with the same genes, moving into a different environment, under different sun and different skin conditions with different food, and then some people getting very, very sick, particularly in the American way of life. But the Japanese members of the family remaining very, very well. And these are the same genetic people, the same family members, but one getting very, very unwell. One of the interesting studies was they did when they watched a Japanese woman moving from Japan, and they moved to America after the Second World War. What happens, they started eating different foods. Now, why did the breast cancer rate skyrocket when they went to America? Well, of course, a key part of it was a lack of vitamin D. How did they find that out? Well, they looked at what they were eating, and what they were eating in Japan was eels. It's very common when you're in Japan, you go out to the corner cafe, you eat a lot of eels. Now, what are eels one of the richest single sources of? It's vitamin D, incredibly rich source of vitamin D, very well assimilated in the human body. When you go to America, the Japanese integrate into American culture, when you go to a cafe in America, of course, they don't serve eels. They serve Big Macs and hamburgers and you know KFC and whatever it is. No vitamin D at all. And on top of that, it causes acidity in the body, constipation, which literally sucks calcium and vitamin D from the body. So you get a, a culture that is getting a lot of vitamin D in their natural environment to a culture that's getting very little, even through the food chain. So we've seen it in epidemiological studies as well. Vitamin D in skin cancer, you're at far higher risk uh, from a vitamin D deficiency from, than you are from skin cancer. That's one of the other interesting things. Spending a little time in the sun every day is not deadly, will not age your skin, nor will it raise your risk of melanoma, which is the most deadly cancer. And this is the one where they do all the studies on melanoma, which is actually one of the most deadly cancers, but one of the rarest cancers as well. Vitamin D reduces your skin cancer risk and as many as 16 other different types of cancer risk as well. Now again, here's that balance of don't get sunburned because that's going to raise your risk. It's not smart. However, vitamin D in small regular amounts decreases your risk of getting skin cancer enormously. So there's a lot of research on that as well. And again, you look at the cultures around the world with the highest exposure of sun have the lowest rates of skin cancer. So it's a very interesting kind of dichotomy if you want to look at it that way. The number of lives saved by people doubling their sun exposure might be 10 times higher than the number of fatal skin cancers that would result. Now, a lot of this goes directly against what you've been told for the last 30 years. So I do understand if some of you have got a kind of really quizzed look on your face right now. And I do understand that because we actually have been told that sunlight is terrible for 30 years. When in actual fact, sunlight isn't terrible at all. Sunlight's very important. However, overexposure is terrible. So there's been a slight tweak of information. And an example of this, if you take the general population of Norway, you double the amount of time that they spend in the sun, one thing will happen. Around 600 people will die each year from skin cancer. So normally 300 people a year die in Norway from skin cancer. If you double the population's time in the sun, therefore you get double the amount of skin cancer deaths. Understandable. That's about 600 people dying. However, if you double the skin exposure or the sun exposure in Norway, and you double the amount of vitamin D that people were getting, you get about 3,000 fewer deaths from vitamin D-related deficiency diseases. So it's really interesting when you look at, well, is it all about avoiding the sun? No, it's not. It's about getting a balance. Making sure you're getting enough vitamin D, but you're not overdoing it. Um, but autoimmune diseases is one of those really critical things when you look at vitamin D and the lack of vitamin D. And this was done by George Ebers. And the interesting thing about this is that he'd brought up this particular topic a lot of times and he'd been laughed at for years. He first raised it, I think, in 2004 and then in 2005, and he kept talking about it, is vitamin D is clearly linked to multiple sclerosis. Clearly linked, we know that it sets off the gene that either raises the risk of multiple sclerosis or not, is done by a lack of vitamin D or not. And he was laughed at, and it took years. And then finally in 2009, there was unrefutable conclusive evidence in the scientific community then embraced it and said, that's great, and welcome to the team, and uh, you're not actually a Fruit Loop anymore at all. And so it was kind of accepted as standard advice. The quite funny thing was that he was laughed at for a long time. And he confirmed it which seriously increases the rate of multiple sclerosis, or MS. Uh, and vitamin D lowers autoimmune diseases, things like uh, MS, type 1 diabetes, uh, IBD, rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of different autoimmune diseases, direct relationships to the, the lack of sunlight around the world. The higher the rates, the lower the sunlight. And again, as you see, diet as well in lifestyle, lifestyle, of course. But the interesting thing when you look at MS is where are the lowest levels of sunlight in the whole world? Is Scotland. They have the lowest levels of sunlight. Which country has the highest levels of MS? Scotland. Now, which country recently has tripled the rate of vitamin D, which they're recommending that everyone has? Scotland. 
because actually now it's even got to a governmental level where they realise now that people getting more sunlight or more vitamin D and what they're doing there is they're fortifying foods. So they're adding a lot of vitamin D to foods to try to get more vitamin D into people. Um, but what the government has found, that even if they do it as an uh, uh, economic model, they look at purely how much money is it going to cost us to look after these people. If we actually give them vitamin D, which is really cheap, and get them a little more sunlight, if we can, or get them out into it, it's actually going to save an enormous amount of money because the amount of diseases that fall out from a lack of vitamin D is extraordinary. And multiple sclerosis, they're very expensive diseases to treat. So even from a financial model, there's a lot of advice now about getting more vitamin D. So vitamin D research, there's over 2,000 studies. Uh, and again, if you want any of the research tonight, please email me. I can literally drown you in it. I've got a specific vitamin D file, which I can, you know, you'll be taking about a year to read. But it's really fascinating stuff. If you've got an interest, let me know. Good levels of vitamin D uh, deliver a number of things. One is a 33% reduction in type 2 diabetes. And again, along with lifestyle, we know that you can wipe out about 95% of type 2 diabetes through changes in diet, lifestyle, and sleep. 50% lower risk of breast cancer, a reduction in overall cancer risk of about 77%, colon cancer incidence by about 50%, about halving the risk of respiratory uh, infections uh, with children, reduced ageing, protects against depression, we know about that from the winter blues and seasonal affective disorders, and about a 72% reduction in the number of falls and fractures in the elderly. So it actually literally gives you stronger bones so you're not falling over nearly as much. So when you do fall, you don't actually break a bone. And lowers the risk of death overall in terms of long-term studies about 25%. So again, where the advice comes from is a mixture of getting out and exercising and being under sunlight. That mixture of being outside under the sunlight and moving is the crucial mix when it comes to sunlight. So this is an interesting one that was done. And this is done uh, in 2010. And what they did here was they looked at a mixture of the blood levels of vitamin D and the higher your blood levels of vitamin D go versus the incidence compared to normal of different uh, diseases. And they found that when they measured people, the higher the levels of uh, vitamin D they had, the lower the levels of illness they had. And they did it over large groups of people, showing that higher levels of heart disease, fractures, multiple sclerosis, and breast cancer. And they all, as you can see from the trend, and rickets is one of those things where we know we can cure rickets. You get enough vitamin D, it's cured, just like that. And that's why we, we knew how to cure it, and it was cured. Now, unfortunately, rickets is rampant. It's rampant across the Western world, and this is something that was cured in our lifetime. It's now everywhere, purely from a lack of sunlight for children, just not getting enough sunlight. It's exploding everywhere. I get the news reports on rickets almost weekly, different pockets around the Western world popping up with rickets explosions with kids. So we know that we can cure rickets with vitamin D, and we know that it's part of lowering the risk levels of these different diseases, having enough vitamin D in the body as well. So a crucial part of lowering your risk for major health problems long term. So are we vitamin D deficient? Yes, we are. We know that. According to health ministry surveys right here in New Zealand, 70 to 90% of us are vitamin D deficient or insufficient. And I'll tell you about shortly how to get a blood test for it and how to measure for it and you can, how you can figure that out. Millions of children are now severely deficient. It's estimated that about a billion people now in the world, mainly in the Western world, of course, because we are pretty much the only culture that actively hides from sunlight exposure in the world. Most of the rest of the world actually lives under sunlight most of the time. So vitamin deficiency, if you're severely deficient in vitamin D, you're 40% more likely to have high blood pressure. You're 30% more likely to suffer from a diseased heart. Your risk of heart attack, heart failure, and stroke is massively increased. You're more than twice as likely to have diabetes. 200% increase in type 1 diabetes in children. There's a lot of really interesting studies about type 1 diabetes too and what triggers it in children or what starts it off. 40% more likely to suffer a respiratory infection. Obviously, we've talked about the immune response and how vitamin D protects that and stimulates the response in the lungs. Much greater, greater risk, obviously, of lung cancer, whether you're a smoker or not. And higher levels of chronic pain. And vitamin D is one of those things that lowers pain, particularly in women. So if you are suffering from conditions, again, you go into the autoimmune diseases with high levels of pain, vitamin D does lower your levels of pain. It makes you more um, uh, tolerant of pain, is a good way of describing it. And you have a three times higher likelihood of dying, which is kind of one of those ridiculous statistics where if you haven't got enough sunlight, then you're at higher risk of death. So what causes vitamin D deficiency? What are the key things that causes it? Well, firstly, obviously, it's a lack of sunlight. Then you've got things like being overweight or obese because vitamin D is stored in the fat cells, so that's where the body tucks it away. And the more that you're carrying, the further away it's stored, of course, keeping the fat away from the vital organs, which means it's harder for the body to get to. Uh, spending more leisure time indoors is another thing that does it, of course. A lack of fibre-rich foods, plant-based whole foods are good sources of vitamin D. Richest source of vitamin D, of course, is your leafy green veggies like your dandelion. And, of course, the animal foods are the eels and your oily fish and your good quality eggs. 
and I'll go over that shortly as well. Constipation as well. Constipation will get rid of vitamin D. A lack of calcium, vitamin C rich foods, plant whole foods. A lack of exercise, of course, is good for keeping your bones strong and keeping vitamin D surging. Soft, fizzy cola energy drinks. Of course, I don't recommend you ever have another one for the rest of your life. You know, If you're going to have a cola, have it as a special treat once a year on Christmas or something. Other than that, don't go near it because they are the most effective ways to make the body and the blood immediately highly acidic. And you don't want to do that because the body then has to get other things to balance the blood and keep your pH level, otherwise you, you get unwell. So salt, soda and soft drinks and things like that. Uh, getting stressed, uh, stressing your immune system. Well-meaning parents overprotecting their children. So that whole thing about you know not allowed out in the sunlight unless you're wearing a hat and shirt and got sun, sunscreen on all over. So uh, And driving to school in cars because then you miss out on that morning sunlight and the morning exercise. So again, that's something that's happened a lot more in society these days as well. Rickets. As I said earlier, rickets was cured. In the 1940s, we cured it. Gone. And it's caused, of course, by simply by a lack of vitamin D. You can wipe it out. It's now exploding everywhere. As far back as 2007, 33% of New Zealand school children in the Ministry of Health surveys showed vitamin D levels low enough to negatively affect bone density and raise their risk for rickets. And here's a really interesting statistic. Girls now break their arms 56 times more often than 40 years ago, and boys 32% more often. Now the breaking of arms, of course, very interesting because if you look at the amount of children that are now in society able and allowed to play in trees and climb trees, is very, very low. There's a lot of parents now that don't let their kids climb a tree because they're worried about them falling out and getting hurt. So I've got, you know, boys and I'm lucky I was raising kids in the 1980s, so I've kind of, I was raising kids climbing trees long before the trend happened where we weren't allowed to climb trees anymore. So I noticed out of my own park, I've actually had experience in the park where I take my, the two young boys, they're climbing a tree. And I've actually witnessed moments when I've had the two boys up in this tree, right up in this tree going, look how high I am, and they're right up the top of this tree yelling out. And I've seen other kids coming over, and I actually witnessed, this was last summer, a girl coming over and start to climb the tree. And then I heard this blood-curdling shriek. But I didn't know what it was but until I noticed there was a mother sprinting across the field. Get away from that tree! You know, and, you know, just not allowing the child to just climb a tree. And, the branch was only this high, you know, this is, you know. So, really interesting when you, uh, and this statistic here, 56% more times, a um, higher percentage of breaking their arms now, I guarantee you that's probably about a thousand percent if you actually looked at how many kids are allowed to climb trees now versus how many were allowed to climb trees in the 40s. I think it would be dramatically larger. So, another one of those things where we know that the bones are much weaker than they used to be. So, here's the full list of vitamin D deficiency symptoms. And again, you could look at this as a mixture of uh, outdoor lifestyle and a lack of sunlight symptoms, as you, you were rightly asked just earlier. You know, that mixture of not getting enough exercise and sunlight outdoors will give you a lack of vitamin D because you need the exercise and you need the sunlight. You need the two together. So, the, as you can see, there's a huge list. Everything, all parts of the body are affected. You know, I won't even read it out because it's all there and I'll flick it to an email anyway. Pneumonia deaths, though, this is a really interesting one too. When you look at, as I was talking about earlier, vitamin D running your immune system and particularly the lining of the cells of the lungs and keeping the lungs and the breathing apparatus working well. When you really look at, okay, well, what is it that does this and keeps us well? Well, when you get pneumonia, of course, that's when you're going to need your immune system to really kick in and be healthy and be strong and get rid of the pneumonia. And we know now that pneumonia deaths are linked to a deficiency. There's a huge study done, in, uh, a Dutch study done, that found vitamin D deficient newborns it's six times higher, that is 500% higher risk of developing lung infection. The kids with the vitamin D deficiency when they were born, massively higher getting sick in that first six to 18 months of life. Same study was done in New Zealand in Waikato, I think it was about two years ago. Uh, and it found that of the 112 Waikato hospitalized pneumonia patients, they found the death rate was 29% amongst all the people that had a vitamin D deficiency, 4% of those people died who had high levels of vitamin D. So 29%, which is almost one in three people died who had a lack of vitamin D from the same illness that other people was only 5% of. So a 60% survival rate as opposed to 96% survival rate. You start to see a dramatic difference in survival rates of infectious diseases through lack of vitamin D. This is Heavy D, by the way, this picture down at the bottom of the, of the um, slide. He's a rapper. He's called Heavy D. That was his name. And of course, he was called Heavy D because he's a big chap. Uh, and it was really sad, actually, because... I'm 44, and he's 44, and he died last year in October, and it was really sad for me because he was one of my favourite rappers. When I was growing up as a kid, he was one of those guys, he rapped with Janet Jackson, he rapped with Michael Jackson on this great song called Jam, which if there's any Michael Jackson fans in the audience, 
There's no song jam, you know the song jam, jam. Anyway, this is a great song, <laughs> one of my favourites. Anyway, he was the guy that rapped on it, and I remember the video. There's this huge guy, and he jumps around, and he's rapping at the video, and he's, I thought he was fantastic. You know, and I know all the words to a lot of his rap songs. And here's the sad thing: is that he died last year, my age. I mean, my age. This is insanity, and he died from a light cause of pneumonia in October last year. He was morbidly obese. He was 156 kilos when he died, so he'd obviously let himself get a little bit overweight. And overweight and obese people uh, need twice the amount of vitamin D, twice the amount, and most of us are deficient as it is, because it gets trapped in fat cells away from those vital organs. Here's the quote from the coroner's office, and this was a quote directly from the coroner last year. He had what appeared to be flu-like symptoms, and then he died. So, you know, I mean, I don't know what his vitamin D levels were, but it really flagged my attention because I know about the link between pneumonia and vitamin D and it massively raises your risk of death if you get pneumonia and you're lacking in vitamin D. And here was a case of someone who was clearly lacking in vitamin D, so it was really sad. So, you know, even famous people with a lot of money still go down the same way. So what are the best sources? The best sources of vitamin D? I know you're all going to want to know about this, so I'm going to go over it really clearly. The best sources of vitamin D is the sun. The next best source, if you can't get it from the sun, is sunlight directly on the skin. Okay, so if you can't get it from the sun, get it from sunlight directly on your skin. Okay, if you can't get it from that, there's this hot thing in the sky. Okay, and you need to get it from that. Okay, that's where you get it from. So if you can't get it from the hot thing in the sky, then you need to get it from more sunlight on the skin. Right, I'm some bit humorous here, but the thing is, you've got to remember, it is the premium source of vitamin D. You can get it in supplements, yes, and I'll talk about them shortly. I'll talk about the food sources. Yes, you can get it in food as well. However, they do not work as effectively. You must not ever think that you can get the same amount from foods you can't. You must use foods as a supplement only, not as a, an overall source. So the skin converts much more than just vitamin D from full spectrum sunlight. Ideally you need to get about 90% from the sun and about 10% from foods. Now obviously if you can't get enough, and you can go through a process where for some people who have very light skin and they take a while to get used to the sun, you go through a process of generally, gently getting your skin used to sunlight. And you can do that and it will take time and I'll, I'll talk about that as well as we go. But sunlight produces 100 times more vitamin D, up to 40,000 IU, than can be safely obtained from a pill. So the sunlight creates an incredible amount, which the body then bioconverts and stores much, much safer and more effectively than you can get in a pill. So I strongly recommend and urge that you look at sunlight as your, as your way to get it. So sunlight directly on the skin synthesizes vitamin D3 sulfate, which is cholecalciferol. And this is water soluble, travels freely through the bloodstream in the body. You cannot overdose on vitamin D from sun exposure. Now don't confuse this with you cannot get sunburn, because I didn't say that, right? You can get sunburn, but you cannot overdose on vitamin D. The body has a natural way of closing off. Once it's got enough vitamin D, it will shut off, doesn't matter how much more sun you get, you won't convert anymore. So the body has this amazing thing called a cutoff switch, which automatically inactivates vitamin D conversion when the body's had enough. Now generally that'll happen when you have that feeling when you go, Oh God, that's great, I've been in the sun, oh, I've really enjoyed it. You know, it feels like I'm a little pinkish, I'm time to get out of the sun. That's generally the time when you're not going to get any more anyway. So the body has this amazing thing where it tells you to get out of the sun, and the sad thing is most of us ignore it. So I'm imploring you to, don't ignore it, when the body says get out of the sun, get out of the sun. That's the way to do it, because you won't get any more vitamin D anyway. So you can overdose on vitamin D pills, that's the important thing to remember, you can overdose on them, they're highly toxic, if you take too many you are in trouble. Supplement pills do not contain the same D3 sulfate as you get converted in the skin. It's not the same. Synthetic vitamin Ds are often chemically extracted sheep lanolin. Now, why do we get it from sheep lanolin? Because the sheep get the sun on their what? On their wool, right? So that's where they get it, just like the rest of us do. Okay, but they have wool, we have skin. So they get it on their wool, and that's where we extract it from. So, you know, I would avoid that personally, but if you do need to get it, I'd recommend D3. Um, to get your vitamin D levels up if you do need to, and you can do that over a period of time while you're integrating sunlight into your life again, if you're not getting enough sunlight. Vitamin D from a pill, though, goes straight to the liver, and the body cannot remove it easily as it is fat soluble, and the body does have a harder time with it when it's in a pill. It can cause a toxic buildup, and we know that there are negative sides to having too much vitamin D in a pill, because the body can't get rid of it. With natural vitamin D, it can. With toxic buildup of synthetic, it can't. So it can result in kidney stones, confusion, a bit of mental imbalance. Uh, and the unsulfated, which is the term to remember, unsalted vitamin D from pills, needs LDL cholesterol to move around. So it actually needs the bad cholesterol to move around the body. So you don't want to raise your bad cholesterol. You want to have a nice healthy cholesterol balance. You need cholesterol, of course. It's very good for you. However, you've got to get the balance right with good and bad cholesterol in the body. That's all you need to know, really. 
Symptoms of vitamin D toxicity, and you'll notice these if you're taking too much, uh, include nausea, vomiting, poor appetite, constipation, weakness, and weight loss. So a mixture of different things with vitamin D pills. So I don't recommend that for long term. You may find for short term it's an appropriate thing to take a vitamin D pill, but not for a long term use. So maybe through winter only. So what are the best food sources? I know many of you are going to be keen on this lot. Uh, number one is eel, and that gives you uh, ergo calciferol, which is D2, and you get that from eel. Secondly is chlorella, it's a great plant source. You can get that in tablets or powder, uh, and two grams gives you about 22 MCGs. Uh, chlorella is like a superfood like spirulina, and that's a very good source. Uh, dandelion, and of course dandelion looks like the sun, and you all know I'm a huge fan of dandelion, I talk about it a lot, but when you look at the richest plant source in the back garden of vitamin D is dandelion, and of course dandelion looks exactly like the sun. So, so if you want to... Sorry, I know this is such a dumb question. It, there's no do dumb questions here. Do you eat like the flower? Yes. The yes, so great question. So the question is what part of the dandelion can you eat and what part can't you eat? I eat the entire thing. What I do is I pick the entire dandelion plant, including the roots and the leaves, the stem and the flower. Uh -huh. And what I do is I throw it in a smoothie. It's a great way to add it to your smoothie because you get it raw, you get it blended, you can tolerate it. Now, I don't recommend doing that if you're going to give your smoothie to the kids because dandelion as a flavor is very, very bitter. So it will increase the bitterness of your smoothie. So what I recommend is make a smoothie for the kids, make it so it's that nice blend of spinach and kale or whatever mixture you've got in apples and lemons, give that to the kids, pour it out for the kids, and then put a bit of dandelion in yours and blend it up. And that's the trick. So I don't recommend it for children just simply because it's so bitter. Unless the kids love the bitter taste if you've got kids, that's great. Um, but start with a small amount with dandelion. Start with a small amount and build it up. But it's extraordinary and it's so good for the skin and it's incredible for the liver. I mean, dandelion is one of those literal superfoods. Have I done a, uh, an email to you on dandelion yet? No, okay. Can you make a note, please? I just love dandelion. I might even write one for you tomorrow because I love it, right? Once you get me started on dandelion. And here's the other thing. Dandelion's free. It's another one of those great things. It's free. It gives you vitamin D. It's in the backyard. We think it's a weed. It actually happens to be one of the most powerful liver transformational devices ever invented by, you know, the planet. It's amazing. So I thoroughly recommend it. And you can get it in your backyard. It's not even sprayed or anything. Very bitter though, so be wary of it. It's very, very bitter. And the thing to remember is anything bitter stimulates uh, the opposite effect in the liver than sugar does. And sugar, the opposite of sugar is dandelion. That's why people do dandelion cleansers and they use it as part of a detox program. So, yeah, so dandelion, it's free. Get it from your backyard. Salmon, mackerel, tuna or sardines. Of course, obviously very rich in oily uh, essential fatty acids and vitamin D as well. So they're good sources if you're eating your fish. Kombu and kelp. Uh, Many sea vegetables are rich in vitamin D, very, very good sources. And almost all seaweed in New Zealand is edible. There's very little that you can't actually eat. You can actually pick it up and eat it. It's just a natural vegetable. We're just, our taste buds are just not used to actually that kind of taste. But, you know, if you want to go to the beach and grab some and throw it in your salad, feel free. You know, you'll be amazed at how edible it is. You, know? you go back, you know, a few hundred years and ask the Māori and they all used to eat lots of seaweeds, you know. It's a natural part of what they're eating. So, you know, we've just gotten kind of used to not eating it. So cod liver oil as well, it's one of the reasons your grandmothers and your mothers used to give it to you as a baby before winter. Do you remember that? I remember it as a kid, but <laughs> going into winter, eat your cod liver oil and be like, ah, what? And here's the thing, the reason they gave it to you was because it was so high in vitamin D. And they gave it to you before winter to protect you from coughs and colds. And it was a solid, gold, logical piece of scientific advice, it really was. And again, our grandmas, all the power to them, they had all the wisdom in the world. Right? Go your good grandmas in the room. So light exposed wild mushrooms as well. So light exposed, you've got to make sure that they're very, very well exposed to light. The more light that the mushrooms are exposed to, they're grown in dark, damp conditions without much light. They won't have much vitamin D, but they convert an enormous amount of vitamin D. And uh, I think it's some of the trendy superfoods that are coming onto the market now are, are high vitamin D level mushrooms. So you can sort them out as well. Free range eggs from uh, non-grain fed chickens that are able to roam around in the sun and eat bugs and grass. Now, I might have said this over and over again, but the reason is that if you give hens B-grade grains, which a lot of people do, corn feed or whatever, right, those grains are very, very uh, acidic and they have very high levels of omega-6. So all that omega-3 has been milled out of them. Now, if you give chickens foods with high omega-6 and low omega-3, they're not going to create eggs with very rich omega-3. It's all going to be high omega-6. Most of us have got 20 times more omega-6 than we have omega-3, which is why people are always taking... Um, fish oil supplements, right, to get their omega-3s up. That's why people take them. Now, you can get them in your eggs if you want to, but you must make sure they're from chickens that are allowed to eat grass and bugs. Really important distinction. So not free range from the supermarket, but actual free, genuine free range from people selling it on the side of the road when you drive the matter matter or something like that. So there's a different distinction. So make sure that the, the chickens are genuinely up there eating. 
because you can call chickens free range and you know that just means they get five minutes of sunlight a day and then they go back in the cage and they can be called free range so just be aware of what you're buying. Raw milk as well is a good source of vitamin D and that was traditionally used as raw milk for those that uh, have raw cows at the home. I mean you know Real cows, <laughs> not raw <real> cows. <laughs> real cows that have raw milk, you know, you can squeeze the udders and all that if you want to. So raw milk is good. Uh, and also yogurt, of course, high in vitamin D if you're making it from your own raw milk. So that's another way. Commercial milk is not a good source. All the vitamin D added is synthetic vitamin D, generally from sheep lanolin. So you're eating sheep wool inside your pasteurized milk. I don't recommend it. It's just not a good source. And it takes about 10 glasses just to get a daily dose. So for those that want to drink 10 glasses of milk, knock yourselves out. I don't personally recommend it. So... The most basic sunlight advice I have before we move on to calcium and spend two hours on calcium and iron, I'm just kidding, um, begin cautiously uh, with as little as five minutes for those that are uh, intolerant of sun, depending on your skin type. Uh, and after a long winter out of the sun, often you should just, you know, you can react. You can get a bit of a reaction on the skin. You, your skin can get a bit red and raw. Be gentle. You know, be gentle on yourself. You can get a bit itchy. Your skin turns red and blotchy. You can become temporarily what they call light sensitive. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually true. And it's pretty much like if you imagine yourself in winter in hibernation and you see the creatures when they actually first come out of hibernation, the polar bears, they're blinking and they slowly get out into the sunlight. You know, they don't run out and take their clothes off and lie in the sun all day, you know. They gently get out into the sun. So I urge you, as I've been doing all night, to be gentle and ease yourself into sunlight. Don't go running into it and getting, you know, stripping into your bikini at lunchtime every day. Just go easy. Okay? So prepare your skin, build up your tolerance gradually. Build it up gradually, even 10 minutes a day, 5 minutes a day. In the morning, in your morning walk, and then slowly mill it into the middle of the day and get 10 minutes at lunchtime. So start early in the year, in spring or early in the morning. A walk in the park is a great way to do it, that way you combine all the best parts. And the ideal is about 15 minutes uh, of direct 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. sunlight daily. So the ideal is about 10 to 15 minutes in that middle part of the day. So 10 a.m., sit out there for 5 minutes. 12 o'clock, get another few minutes, you know. 2 o'clock, get another few minutes on your morning breaks. So again, not enough to burn. Now, if more than five minutes at that time of the day burns you, then don't do five minutes. Start in the morning and gradually build up. So again, be gentle. Be gentle with yourself. You'll know when you've had enough and your skin will turn the lightest color of pink. You'll get a, a slight tinge on the skin. And it will vary with different skin tones. Someone like myself, I've spent a lot of time in the sun over the years. I can tolerate a lot more sun. Other people can tolerate lower amounts. And it depends on your diet as well. So what you're eating as well will also dictate how much your skin will actually allow sunlight to get in. Um, so depending on skin, sunlight levels, um, and the other thing is sunscreen. Um, any sunscreen over a factor of about 8 will wipe out all the UVB. So anything over 8, no UVB at all, so no vitamin D creation, zero. Okay, so that's the thing to remember with sun factors, is they wipe out both. A lot of sunscreens will wipe out all the vitamin uh, UVB and no v UVA, which is kind of absurd when you think about it, because like, UVA is the dangerous part and UVA is the beneficial part, so kind of ironic. However, this is not a sunscreen seminar, and I could do two hours on sunscreen and skin cancer and all that, and maybe we'll do that another day. Uh, but the key thing to remember, if it's over vitamin, uh, if it's over level of factor eight, then you're not gonna get vitamin D. So your diet also has a huge influence as well. So eating things like broccoli and orange foods and red foods uh, have a huge internal protection against UV damage. So that has a big influence as well. It's where you get the things like anthocyanins and paranthocyanins and uh, limonoids and carotenoids, plant dioxins, all the different colours that you get. And it's one of those reasons why when you eat uh, foods that are pinkish in colour, for instance, lobsters and crabs and uh, salmon, things like that, they have high levels of astaxanthin. And astaxanthin is a carotenoid that they eat, which helps protect their skin as well. So if you're eating a lot of those um, orangey and red kind of foods, you will find that your skin does get more of an orangey flavour about it, the Spanish kind of look. And I sometimes get that too when I'm having a lot of spirulina or a lot of that kind of orangey food. I get a kind of a bit of a, an orangey glow on as well. So you can actually, you know, that's a beta carotene as well, which is the orange pigment in carrots, which comes out of the skin, which is why you have a lot of carrots. You can often go orange. It's the same thing. But the funny thing is that protects your skin from sunburn. So making sure you've got a good amount of fresh fruits and vegetables. Luckily enough, Mother Nature tends to give us lots in summer when there's a lot of sun. Mother Nature gives us lots of foods to protect us from the sun. Pretty perfect system when you think about it. Huh? So, sunshine is better for us, far better for us than we think. That's one of the things I'd like to leave you with tonight when you think about the vitamin D part of the evening. Playing in the sunshine every day is far better than, than a library full of health advice. Vitamin D, the way to look at it, is free medicine from the sky. Free medicine from the sky. A severe lack of vitamin D is far more deadly to long term than is the risk of skin cancer. And again, if you want those studies, please feel free. I've, I've got literally truckloads of them. I haven't seen them out. 
Uh, the rule is very simple, get regular sunlight, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Directly on your skin, don't get burnt. It doesn't work through glass. And uh, I'd like to finish the vitamin D part on my favorite quote from Joel, which he said, my little youngest boy, he said over the summer when we were talking about sunlight, and he goes, yeah, we need sunshine, just like flowers need sunshine. And I thought, bless, you know, that's just exactly a nice way to put it. We do, we need sunlight, we need sunshine, so get your sunshine. So, measuring your vitamin D levels. If you have concerns about them, you can get them measured. Get a blood test for serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And I've put this in a fat mail for you, so you will get this information on how to do it. The ideal is about 60 to 80 to get the full benefits in the blood, and you can get that done. Uh, there's some controversy at the moment about, I think, vitamin D. It's kind of a harder test to get now. Some doctors will do it and some won't. One uh, option there, just for people watching at home, uh, is uh, <laughs> that uh, you, it's cheaper for doctors to not do that. Cheaper to actually give out the pill, so yeah, who knows. So, overweight and obese people need twice the amount. I've talked about that. It gets trapped in the fat cells, so you need to get a higher dose, obviously. Uh, combinations and foods are also essential. So if you're wanting to absorb your vitamin D, it's important that not only do we look at vitamin D as the only thing from the sunlight, because that's the thing about sunlight, it doesn't just give us vitamin D, it's just that vitamin D is what we measure. Sunlight gives us a whole lot of other things as well, which we'll discover over time. But vitamin D needs about 12 other things to work fully in the body. And if your diet does not contain enough essential fatty acids for a start, then your body cannot produce its own vitamin D. So again, it goes back to, and exactly what you said earlier about exercise and sunlight and a whole mixture of things, you need to make sure your diet is healthy as well. Because if you haven't got enough essential fatty acids in the body, much like the chicken's egg, a chicken that is unhealthy will not produce a healthy egg with essential fatty acids and high levels of vitamin D in it. But if, a, if the chicken is healthy, it's getting sunlight, it's eating bugs, it's eating grass, then it will produce a really good healthy egg. And you'll notice the difference in the taste and the colour as well. It'll be bright yellow inside, of course, that orangey colour. So your body cannot produce its own, so making sure that you're getting a really good whole food plant-based diet, of course, is essential. Uh, you cannot create collagen, a lack of vitamin D and zinc means you can't get that, which works with the protectors of copper and selenium. The advice, eat a whole food plant-based diet, rich in green vegetables and healthy oils. Make sure you're getting lots of good, rich, healthy, oily foods, uh, and alongside that, lots of leafy green vegetables as well to make sure that you can assimilate your vitamin D. So again, it's part of a whole picture. So vitamin D and calcium, if you don't have enough calcium, you do not absorb enough. So if you don't have enough vitamin C, you don't absorb enough calcium or silica. And the primary biological re regulator of calcium metabolism and the bone health, if you're thinking about, I need more calcium, is vitamin D. So there's a massive link there, which is why you find calcium pills are often sold with the vitamin D added as well. And without enough vitamin D, or with enough vitamin D, a healthy body absorbs 30% more of the calcium available. Without enough vitamin D, it drops to about 10%. So it's a massive difference. It's three times the amount of calcium absorbed in the body if you've got enough vitamin D. Again, which is why they put in pills together. So when it comes to calcium, which is how we move from vitamin D to calcium, is the best way to get it is through foods. It's always the best way to get it. Always get it from uh, food sources rather than supplementation. The amount of calcium absorbed depends on the interaction with other constituents. Same with other nutrients, vitamin C for instance. If you eat an apple, you don't just get vitamin C, you get about 60 different things, all working with the vitamin C for full absorption. Calcium is exactly the same. Food calcium is nine times better absorbed in the human body than what you find, calcium carbonate, three times more than calcium gluconate, which are the ones the majority of pills are used, and calcium citrate as well for that matter. Single most important aspect when you're taking calcium, though, is that it's retained, absorbed, digested, and utilized in the body, because getting into the bones, absorption into the bones is key. It's a crucial thing. And of course, most of you are wanting to have healthy bones. To have healthy bones, you've got to have good levels of calcium stuck onto your collagen model, which is what your skeleton is made of. 90% of it's collagen. Collagen comes from vitamin C. Vitamin C only comes in fruits, vegetables, and sprouts. So the way to stimulate good, strong collagen is through having the plant-based diet, making sure then that you've got enough calcium in your diet as well, and of course getting sunlight and exercise to strengthen the bones and give you vitamin D. So bone health requires collagen, vitamin C, vitamin D, calcium, sunlight, all working together in exercise to give you strong, healthy bones, which is why we've seen and we know that you can increase your bone density at any age by doing weights, increasing your weights. Simple way to go. So we know about all that, and we know that calcium works alongside increased muscular exercise. Calcium, one of the most important minerals, of course. You guys know well about calcium for the heart, the blood, the bones. All the bone structures rely on calcium. And your bones are a living tissue matrix, protein-based collagen matrix, which then collagen is put on top of. Uh, sorry, calcium is put on top of. So don't be confused by thinking that your bones are made of calcium, because they're not. Calcium is just a small part of the mineral base that's added to collagen, which is what your actual bones are made of, which is protein-based. Just two tablespoons of tahini, for instance, or five figs, delivers 200 milligrams of calcium. Now, there's groups of people around the world that have healthy, strong bones, 
and live long lives without any bone problems at all. They get by on two to three hundred milligrams of calcium a day. So that's a good dose in just five dried figs, getting a good dose of calcium. So there's a lot of different ways to get calcium. We'll go over where you get it from in a minute. Children in Japan, China and other countries consume just 300 milligrams of calcium a day, still develop very strong, healthy bones. So again, there's a lot of marketing about calcium in New Zealand that you need 1,200 milligrams a day or 800 milligrams a day. You do if your diet is very acidic and the body's having to use a lot of calcium to buffer the blood. If your blood is acidic, then yes, you do. If you're eating a plant-based whole food diet, you're getting your sunlight, you're exercising, you're well-slept, you need a far lower amount of calcium. So it's all about balance as well, which is why those environments where people are living outside, eating a lot of plants, getting the sunlight, getting enough sleep, actually get by on very lower levels of calcium because they don't need it to buffer their blood as much as we do. So so much a part of our toxic lifestyle requires that we have high levels of calcium. So a great way to do that, of course, is eat well and all that. One calcium myth, of course, is that uh, you need to take your calcium in a two to one ratio. Calcium magnesium, it's not true at all completely untrue in fact. In nature there are no calcium rich foods that are naturally exist that are calcium rich that have a two to one with, race, uh, with um, magnesium. Strong bone centenarians, when you look at what they eat, they're actually not eating two to one parts of calcium and magnesium. They have strong healthy bones. In mother's breast milk, there's ten parts calcium to one part magnesium. So anyone concerned that mother's breast milk got it wrong? No? Okay, good. Because um, mother's breast milk was built strong healthy bones and strong healthy children and has them grow very, very well on a calcium magnesium ratio of 1 to 10, 10 to 1. The Chinese, the Polish, the African, the Japanese have had strong bones for thousands of years without any food in their environment at a 2 to 1 ratio of calcium magnesium. So when you look at the long term studies, it's actually a marketing exercise. So do you need magnesium? Absolutely. Many of us are low in magnesium. What is the single best way to get magnesium into the human body? Leafy green vegetables. They are the best source of magnesium. So get more greens into you. Most of you are eating a lot of greens, you're getting good levels of magnesium. So what about cow's milk? Is it a good source of calcium? Well, with vegetable calcium, it's very alkalining, it's high fibre, high vitamin C, prebiotic rich, as we talked about in the last seminar. Prebiotics are the food for your probiotics, which run your immune system alongside vitamin D. Raw, of course, you can eat your vegetables raw, you have high absorption and preserve the bones. And it contains all the cofactors as well. So this is what you get when you eat vegetable calcium sources. When you eat milk calcium, and I'm, I'm talking here in pasteurised commercial milk, which is what generally most of us have our exposure to. It's acidic as opposed to alkaline. There's zero fibre, zero vitamin C, zero prebiotics. It's pasteurised as opposed to raw. has about a 35% uh, uptake of calcium as opposed to much higher levels, up to 60% or so in your, in your tahinis and things. And has high protein and high phosphorus. So not as good as calcium uptake. And we'll get into this in a lot more detail in the dairy product seminar. We'll go right into the heart of all this kind of stuff. So, the best calcium sources, I'll whip them all up right on the screen so you can see them all here. And again, I'll be sending you out uh, this somewhere on an email in the next week or so. But you've got everything from leafy greens, parsley particularly, tahini, almonds, a lot of nuts as well, aduki beans, things like oysters as well, and you get some good fish as well if you're wanting to eat fish, things like tuna and mackerel. Same fish, ironically, they have the good protein and the good essential fatty acids, also have the good levels of calcium as well. So that's helpful. Kale as well. For those who don't know what kale looks like, this was freshly picked for me by a fantastic person here, right here tonight. Thank you very much. That will be in my belly tomorrow morning. Bok choy, romaine, lettuce, pinto beans, and tofu and things as well. So a nice mixture as well. And kale is a wonderful source of calcium. Wonderful. So the truth about calcium uptake, if you want to know what you really need to make sure that you get enough calcium in the human body and it's absorbed, that's what you need. Now, can you get all of this in a pill? No. Absolutely not. There's no way. Right? So all of this is a mixture of things. And it's exactly as we've talked about today, it is a mixture of a number of things working together that gives you your immune system function, your health and your longevity, and gives you that good genetic expression. So you need essential fatty acids, enzymes, you get some of these foods are in eggs, and some of these foods are in, uh, these nutrients are in fish, and some are in leafy green vegetables, and some are in nuts and seeds, and some come from sunlight on the skin, and so you need that whole mixture of things. But this is what you need to get good calcium uptake, which is why an entire mixture of your diet is so important. So, what about iron? So let's have a talk about iron. How does that work alongside all this? Well, iron is very interesting as well. Iron is very, very high in a plant-based diet. That's the really interesting thing. And studies have shown continuous that vegetarians actually have the same risk as meat eaters when it comes to iron deficiency. It's a complete myth. If you want to lose iron in the blood, eat the modern diet, because that will do it. Vegetarians can have enormously strong levels of iron. I mean, every cell in the human body contains iron. It's recycled. It's one of those things that's interesting. Unless you bleed, uh, which of course, which is why women, when they have menstruation and when you give birth, that's when you lose the most iron. 
which is why if you're eating iron-rich foods in that week leading up to your period, you'll find the period has a whole different experience. And that's why you get people in Asia where you get the lowest levels of, of premenstrual syndrome problems, where you get the lowest men uh, menstrual problems and period issues, is when you're having the high levels of plant-based diet and good levels of iron and all those good nutrients leading into your period, you have a much more balanced period. So a very different experience when you're eating lots of iron-rich foods. So iron stays in the blood for up to about three months and the body gets recycled. Again, it's like when you're fasting and the proteins get recycled. Iron gets recycled as well. The body has an amazing process of reusing iron in young, healthy blood cells. Um, and the rural vegetarian Chinese eat pretty much completely plant-based diet. They eat a little bit of meat occasionally or fish if they can get predominantly it's plants. They get 34 milligrams of iron a day on a plant-based whole food diet. Now the USA, the current modern intake in America, is about 18 milligrams a day, and they do that on an animal-rich diet. So can you get good levels of iron or vegetarian diet? Absolutely you can, t twice the amount. I'm a classic, and in almost every possible measure, when you look at the rural Chinese versus current Americans, there's no competition at all. The rural Chinese are healthier in every possible measure, whether it's heart disease rates, osteoporosis rates, breast cancer rates, all the different levels of disease are far lower in the rural Chinese that are eating more plants. So you can get uh, you know, very, very high levels of iron. I'm a classic example. Trey is my eldest boy who's about to turn 23. He and I give blood occasionally, and sometimes we give blood together, sometimes separately. But when we give blood, they like it so much, and it's so high in iron that they want to literally, you know, <laughs> suck all the blood out of our bodies because they go, this is amazing blood, you know, and they think, oh, you've just eaten a steak, and, you know, we need to take all your blood. And I say, well, you know, I haven't eaten red meat for 26 years, actually. And they go, oh, how did you live so long and how are you still alive? And, you know, then we have this whole debate about meat and it's quite interesting. But um, the interesting thing is my iron levels are incredible, absolutely through the roof. I haven't eaten red meat 26 years since so I had a piece of red meat. So, you know, can you have healthy iron levels and continue on with healthy iron levels and good lens without meat? Yes, you can. So, you know, interesting when you look at it. I haven't eaten it for a long time, very high levels of iron. I have spirulina as well. It's a good source of iron as well. We'll go into that in a minute as well. Another way of raising your iron levels for those women that need it. So iron anemia. The interesting thing is iron anemia around the world decreased during World War II. And this was noticed right throughout all those countries uh, when there was widespread meat shortages. Anemia levels went down, not up. You'd think it would go the other way around, but it didn't. The higher your plant-based whole food diet is, the more iron you would absorb and digest. Now this is the interesting thing. People don't realize with iron, a key part of it is what else is going on in your stomach as to whether you're going to absorb it or not take it. Things like apple cider vinegar, of course, maintaining a low pH level, which is what I recommend you do in the morning. As you know, you have a, a drink with a bit of lemon juice, maybe some aloe juice and apple cider vinegar. Really great way to stimulate the body, gives you fermented foods first thing in the morning, stimulates digestion, and adjusts your pH level in the stomach. That enhances iron absorption. So apple cider vinegar and good fermented foods will increase dramatically the amount of iron that you can absorb, which is yet another reason why fermented foods are so good. Dairy foods can reduce your iron absorption up to 70%. This has been shown time and time again. Children on a high dairy food diet, much, much, lowers of, uh, much lower levels of iron and iron deficiency rates, high levels of iron deficiency rates. And iron absorption is all about the gut. Again, as we talked about in the last seminar, the prebiotics and probiotics, the microflora in the gut. You need to have that balance to absorb your iron effectively. Raw, sprouted and fermented whole foods vastly increase your iron uptake. The more prebiotic, vitamin C rich foods you eat, the better your iron levels will be. Vitamin C, as we know, doubles your iron intake. So you can actually eat half the amount of iron, but if you've got vitamin C rich diet, <coughs> you'll absorb twice as much. So you only need to eat a small amount, but your uptake is much, much better. So copper is also critical for transport around the body. And if you look at foods like, for instance, freshly sprouted mung beans, are almost the perfect iron rich food because they are prebiotic, so they feed your gut, they've got digestive enzymes for absorption, they're very high in iron. They're very high in copper, and they're high, one of the highest foods on the planet on vitamin C, which feeds your collagen and helps your iron absorption. So again, increasing your sprouts, and it's quite funny lately, Trace and I have been eating, obviously, you eat an enormous amount of salad during summer if you're eating a plant-based diet. We'll be noticing on our, on our salads in the, in the middle of the day, we, we'll have the raw salad, we'll have a whole lot of freshly sprouts on top, and then we'll have uh, sauerkraut on top of that with some apple cider vinegar dressing. So you've got raw sprouted and fermented, and nothing else, you know, massively high fibre. Great bowel motions, of course, as you're all well aware when you're eating a plant-based diet. But on top of that, that incredible mixture there will be giving you an enormous dose of iron and enabling you to uptake your iron much higher because it's got all the different aspects to it that work. Because iron, you know, Mother Nature doesn't deliver things in one-off little pill that gives you everything you need. It doesn't work that way. It's a whole system that works together. 
So spirulina is a great iron tonic. Obviously I worked for a company that sold spirulina for 17 years, so I know all about spirulina. But just in terms of a few things about it, very interesting in the sense that it's absorbed at about 95%. It's a great whole superfood, which gives you iron absorption very well. For those women uh, who need more iron, you can take up to 10, 20 grams of iron, uh, spirulina a day. You can also fast with the spirulina and get higher iron uptakes while you're fasting as well if you want to. Um, but the key thing to remember with foods is that iron is bonded to protein in foods. That's the key thing about foods, plant-based foods, things like phycocyanin, which protects it and keeps it as safe iron in the blood. Plant foods, of course. Many pregnant women uh, take a lot of spirulina too to raise their iron levels before they give birth because that last trimester, the last three months, of course, is where the first four months of baby's life, that's where all the iron comes from, is in the last three months of the pregnancy. So you've got seven months' worth of life being dictated to by three months' worth of dietary intake. So important to make sure you've got enough iron during pregnancy, particularly the last three months, and that's where you can get an enormous amount through spirulina. So avoid iron pills. I don't recommend iron pills apart from real emergencies, but they actually basically don't work. They're very ineffective. They're toxic. They build up in your organs. They cause side effects for many people. They cause constipation, intestinal pain. This is very common. Many of you will have tried iron pills, and many of you will have had exactly this. This is why people try them. Then they end up on iron injections as well. They're not from organic compounds, so they're not well absorbed at all. Body finds them almost impossible to absorb. And an overdose of synthetic iron pills in small children can be lethal, and it's actually the highest cause, most common cause of US poisoning of infants, is kids actually getting into the parents covered and taking iron pills. It's the highest cause uh, of overdose in America in terms of what happens with children poisoning. Causes vomiting, diarrhea, pain, uh, sinusitis, diarrhea, all kinds of awesome stuff, and sudden death. So, you know, iron can be very dangerous, so I don't recommend taking it in high doses. Great food sources of iron. I've given you two lists here, which again, uh, you'll be getting on an email. On the left, you'll, feel, you'll see the, the, the richest sources. I'm pretty much done it from the richest sources down. So you've got spirulina, tempeh, which of course is a whole fermented superfood. Uh, sprouted soybeans, lentils, mung beans as well, which is wonderful. Spinach and kale, particularly raw or in a blend. Whole lot of beans as well, tofu, raisins of course. And how can you tell? Often foods will be quite dark, particularly natural foods, very high levels of iron. Molasses and raisins are classic examples. Mere black has colour, very high levels of iron in them. Dark, leafy greens, that iron influence as well. Kale and spinach and silver beet. Oats, millet, brown rice, all good sources. Uh, and dark chocolate. And I put dark chocolate right at the bottom because I don't want you to all eat lots of dark chocolate thinking, great, Jason told me to eat lots of dark chocolate to get my iron. No, dark chocolate is a nice treat occasionally. And yes, it does have some iron in it, but also it does have some negative things as well. So just, you know, as a treat, once you've eaten all the other things, you can have some dark chocolate. Okay? So that's how, that's how the mixture goes. So goody stuff first, a little bit of dark chocolate. Then. Don't look at it as a reliable food source of iron. Okay? So free iron can be deadly, can be very dangerous. Iron in vegetables is safe, non-hame bound iron, which is attached to proteins in the body. So remember, non-hame bound irons are the safe irons. This does not lead to iron problems. So don't be concerned about getting too much iron if you're eating plant-based foods. Iron and plant-based is generally completely safe and regulated by the body in a way that guards against overabsorption. The body gets rid of it. So free iron, however, is quite different. It can trigger all kinds of things like inflammation, free radical generation, lipid peroxidization, and can lead to cancer. So we know too much free iron in the body is dangerous. So that needs to be talked about if you're discussing iron, you do need to touch on that. So what are the things that causes iron to become free or what they call unbound in the human body? and released into surrounding tissues. Well, the key thing, things are synthetic iron pills, high doses of animal foods, and alcohol intake. And the key one in those three, to be honest, is the alcohol intake. It seems to have an incredible effect. At, yeah, I know some of you are not enjoying me this evening because of the things I'm saying. <laughs> but the key thing about alcohol is it does tend to um, remove iron from safety and leave it in deposit in the body, particularly with women in the nipple ducts. That's where the problems seem to happen, which is why uh, unbound iron has dramatic increases in breast cancer. And it's another one of the reasons why high alcohol intake directly related to high breast cancer cases. And we know that every case of, sorry, every glass of uh, alcohol you drink raises your breast cancer risk. We know that it's been shown over and over and over and over, over again. One of those reasons is that alcohol releases iron in the body. So iron from meat is hame iron. It's different to non-hame iron. can end up creating an overload. Some people with meat iron intake is fine. So for some people it's fine. For other people it leads to an, uh, an overdose. But women drinking more than 20 grams a day, which is not a lot, significantly increase the free iron in their breast tissue, as we're seeing where it gets leaked into the nipple ducts, and have a higher incidence of the most deadly breast cancer. 
so we know that. So if you have concerns about breast cancer, I recommend you cut your drinking down or only have it as a special occasion or give it up completely. So one or the other. So directly related. So as a summary tonight, I know it's been a very intense seminar, so I appreciate your, uh, your attention this evening. Uh, as a summary, I've done a uh, summary of what removes iron, vitamin D, uh, and calcium from the body, and then the things that we need to do to make sure that we've got them in the body. So, what removes them? Obviously smoking, uh, uh, drinking alcohol, as we just touched on, uh, being overweight, carrying too much weight, we'll do that, particularly with vitamin D, processed animal foods, refined sugar-rich foods, of course that's that deadly combination of uh, your sugary foods, your fatty foods, and your high animal foods, that's the combination in the modern diet, of course lacking in vegetables. Uh, soda drinks, fizzy drinks, energy drinks, those kind of things. High stress lifestyle, of course that will remove just about anything. High stress is one of the main killers on the planet. Sedentary lifestyle, not enough exercise, and we've talked a lot about getting out there and getting exercise. A little tip if you want more energy, get up and go for a walk. Walking creates energy like nothing else. If you're tired, go for a walk, you'll be amazed at how much energy you get when you get back. A lack of sleep as well, crucial, absolutely crucial to get enough sleep. If you want to be well and healthy long term, you must get about 8 hours sleep a night. Very important, sleep, 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 could do two hours on sleep alone. Being constipated, obviously a fall out of bad diet, uh, that will rip calcium and vitamin D absorption from the body because it's when you're blocking up the very part of the body that is trying to absorb the nutrition, it can't get through, you get the fallout. A toxic environment and avoiding sunlight. So these are the key things that will remove vitamin D, calcium and iron. What are the key things that deliver them to the human body? Plant-based whole foods, obviously, raw, fresh, organic vegetables, broccoli, watercress, cruciferous vegetables, very high in iron, calcium, and vitamin D, soaked raw nuts and seeds, of course, to get your essential fatty acids. You want to have a nice mixture of essential fatty acids in the body to get your, excuse me, to get your vitamin D as well, because they all work together in terms of absorption. Saying healthy, slim, and fit, so keeping your fitness levels up and staying in a good body shape. A daily one hour vigorous walk in the sunshine, it's one of the reasons why I constantly recommend get up in the morning and just walk in the sunshine. It's the most amazing exercise there is. And it's one of the few exercises that you will be able to do for your entire life. And building those kind of habits, I started walking about 15 years ago and it's just become an absolute habit for me to walk, 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 walk. And now I'm so fit, if I don't carry something heavy, I don't sweat when I walk at all. I can just walk all day and I don't break a sweat at all. So you can build your fitness up. And when I first started walking, Trace and I would walk together when we lived in Mount Albert years ago. And she was much faster than me. She's got these really long legs, right? And she'd be walking and I'd be semi-running to keep up. And so you can start off from a, a lower base of fitness and actually grow into walking fitness just by doing more and more every day. My mum's done the same thing. She's now a very fit walker. She didn't used to be, so you can do it over time. But a daily one hour vigorous walk in the sunshine is so good for you in so many ways. And it's very creative for the brain as well. You think a lot, you solve problems when you walk. And you get sunlight, so vitamin D as well. So it's a great, great way to do it. Sleeping eight hours a night, very important to get that. Fasting regularly on fresh vegetable juice will keep your digestive system pumping very, very well. Keep the body well regulated. Feeding your probiotics as well, so having prebiotic rich foods, either fermented foods uh, or raw foods that feed your digestive enzymes in the gut. And eating sprouts as well. I recommend sprouts, very, very, very high levels of sprouts in your diet to increase the probiotics and relax and lower your stress as well. So if you're in a stressful environment, see if you can remove yourself or you know, uh, at least start to see it differently to lower your stress levels because you know, stress is so much about attitude, environment and things as well. So trying to lower stress is important as well. Um, so we've come to the end of the seminar now.